Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our daily devotion for Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020. I pray that as we spend our time together in God's word right now, God will use his word to strengthen our faith in him and cause us to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Savior. Today, we remember the prophet Jonah. A singular prophet among the many in the Old Testament, Jonah, the son of Amittai, was born about an hour's walk from the town of Nazareth. The focus of his prophetic ministry was the call to preach at Nineveh, the capital of pagan Assyria. His reluctance to respond and God's insistence that his call be heeded is the story of the book that bears Jonah's name. Although the swallowing and disgorging of Jonah by the great fish is the most remembered detail of his life, it is addressed in only three verses of the book. Throughout the book, the important theme is how God deals compassionately with sinners. Jonah's three-day sojourn in the belly of the fish is mentioned by Jesus as a sign of his own death, burial, and resurrection. Our psalm for today is Psalm 133. How delightfully good when brothers live together in harmony. It is like fine oil on the head, running down on the beard running down Aaron's beard onto his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, falling on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has appointed the blessing, life forevermore. Nehemiah has now completed his project of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. He is now going to turn his attention to working together with the priest Ezra to bring about some spiritual reforms. When the wall had been rebuilt and I had the doors installed, the gatekeepers, singers, and Levites were appointed. Then I put my brother Hanani in charge of Jerusalem, along with Hananiah, commander of the fortress, because he was a faithful man who feared God more than most. I said to them, do not open the gates of Jerusalem until the sun is hot, and let the doors be shut and securely fastened while the guards are on duty. Station the citizens of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts, and some at their homes. The city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and no houses had been built yet. Nehemiah then spends the rest of chapter 7 recalling or recounting the many people who did come from uh, Babylon back to Jerusalem and to the Ju area of Judah to resettle there after the Babylonian captivity. Once we arrive at chapter 8, then, he turns his attention to the reading of the law by the, pro, by the priest Ezra. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate. They asked the, Ezra, the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel. On the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. While he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out of it from daybreak until noon before the men, the women, and those who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a high wooden platform made for this purpose. Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah stood beside him on his right. To his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book in full view of all the people, since he was elevated above everyone. As he opened it, all the people stood up. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, with the, and with their hands uplifted all the people said, Amen, Amen. Then they knelt low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Neasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Jazabad, Hanan, and Paliah, who were Levites, explained the law to the people as they stood in their places. They read out of the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was read. Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. 
Then he said to them, go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, since today is holy. Don't grieve. Then all the people began to eat and to drink, send portions, and have a great celebration, because they had understood the words that were explained to them. On the second day, the family heads of all the people, along with the priests and Levites, assembled before the scribe Ezra to study the words of the law. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites should dwell in shelters during the festival of the seventh month. So they proclaimed and spread this news throughout the towns and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hill country and bring back branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make shelters, just as it is written. The people went out, brought back branches, and made shelters for themselves on each of their rooftops and courtyards the court of the house of God, the square by the water gate, and the square by the Ephraim gate. The whole community that had returned from exile made shelters and lived in them. The Israelites had not celebrated like this from the days of Joshua son of Nun until that day, and there was tremendous joy. Ezra read out of the book of the law of God every day, from the first day to the last. The Israelites celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. As Paul continues to write to his young colleague, Timothy, he turns his attention to instructions for various things that should be done among the people in the congregation there. Don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters with all purity. Support widows who are genuinely in need. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them learn to practice godliness toward their own family first and to repay their parents, for this pleases God. The widow who is truly in need and left all alone has put her hope in God and continues night and day in her petitions and prayers. However, she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command this also, so that they will be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. No widow is to be enrolled on the list for support unless she is at least 60 years old, has been the wife of one husband, and is well known for good works. That is, if she has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when they are drawn away from Christ by desire, they want to marry, and will therefore receive condemnation because they have renounced their original pledge. At the same time, they also learn to be idle, going from house to house. They are not only idle, but are also gossips and busybodies, saying things they shouldn't say. Therefore, I want younger women to marry, have children, manage their households, and give the adversary no opportunity to accuse us, for some have already turned away to follow Satan. If any believing woman has widows in her family, let her help them. Let the church not be burdened, so that it can help widows in genuine need. Our writing for today is from the pen of Martin Luther, as he talks to us about the meaning of worship. Worship is not a function of the mouth, but of the whole body. It is to bow the head, bend the body, fall on the knees, prostrate oneself, and so forth, and to do such things as a sign and acknowledgement of an authority and power, just as people bow in silence before secular princes and lords, and just as popes, bishops, abbots, and people generally have themselves honored and adored by bowing and kneeling, and so forth. Such outward adoration is what the scriptures really mean by worship. We read in the scriptures that worship, or adoration, is rendered outwardly both to God and to kings without distinction, just as bowing and kneeling are still rendered outwardly both to God and to men. From this understanding of outward worship, you will also understand what Christ meant by true spiritual worship. It is the adoration or bowing of the heart, 
so that from the bottom of your heart you thereby show and confess yourself to be his subordinate creature. For from this you see what's true worship, see that true worship can be nothing else than faith. It is faith's sublimest activity with respect to God. For no one is capable of such heartfelt confession, adoration, bending, and bowing, or whatever you want to call it, before God in his heart, unless he unwaveringly holds God to be his Lord and Father, from whom he receives and will receive all good things, and through whom, without any merit on his part, he is redeemed and preserved from all sins and evil. Our hymn for today is a stanza from the hymn, Praise the Almighty. Penitent sinners for mercy crying, pardon and peace from him obtain. Ever the wants of the poor supplying, their faithful God he will remain. He helps his children in distress, the widows and the fatherless. Alleluia, alleluia. And we pray, Lord God, Heavenly Father, through the prophet Jonah, you continued the prophetic pattern of teaching your people the true faith and demonstrating through miracles your presence in creation to heal it of its brokenness. Grant that your church may see in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the final end times prophet, whose teaching and miracles continue in your church through the healing medicine of the gospel and the sacraments. <laughs> through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you again for spending this time in God's word with me today. God be with you and bless your day. And I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.